wanted to know what on earth are the merits that make Mrs. Marshall affected by spirits. Wanted to know why respectable dead come back to life at five shillings a head. Good evening, friends. Welcome back to History Obscura this chilly, blustery night. The Lycoi are wrapped in their quilts while I huddle stiffly by the microphone. And what an excellent time for a seance, wouldn't you say? You know, once upon a time, communicating with spirits of lost family members and friends, or indeed with famous characters from throughout history, was a particularly alluring prospect to Victorian and Edwardian audiences in their day. Even the World War eras were chock full of spiritualism, wherever it could fit into the corners of life between poverty, fear, and violence. And becoming a medium, as in the person in the middle of a line of communication between the living and the dead, was a job opportunity that allowed for many women to become first-time entrepreneurs. The 19th century populations of Great Britain, France, America, and Canada was very ripe for plucking as far as the spirituality industry was concerned. At a time when you commemorated your loved ones with a photograph of their dead self dressed in Sunday best, and used a spirit board to call out to friends lost in the Boer Wars, the Zulu Wars, the Opium Wars, and whichever of the endless exploits of the British Army during that century you participated in. Life after death was big business. Many spirit mediums used magic tricks in the parlor to make it seem as though they were communicating with the dead. Things they did in their day might seem obvious to a modern audience, but magic tricks really stunned Victorian audiences. Seances could take hours of preparation. People were wallpapered inside hollowed out walls to later make sounds during the seance. Discreet wires were installed to lift tables and make trumpets appear to play sounds by themselves. And to achieve the horrifying effect of ectoplasm, bedsheets were soaked in flour and shapes molded into them to resemble faces or hands. Sometimes these bits of cloth were pre-swallowed for regurgitation later, when the lighting was at its most flickering and vague. Life-sized replicas of the dead were also constructed for the all-important ghost passing through the room experience. Sometimes mediums used various accessories. One used a long kid evening glove stuffed with wool to reach over and touch the audience members seated at the table. Another had a black glove painted with luminous paint. Yet another concealed a spirit baby beneath her skirts that is, a stuffed shape attached to a stick that she could maneuver with her foot. The spirit baby would come peer over the table when called from the netherworld. The medium and her assistants were helped greatly by the seance room being in almost complete darkness. In 1882, the Society for Psychical Research was formed. This resulted in the numbers of mediums producing ectoplasm going down, and the numbers being prosecuted for fraud going up. All the leading mediums were, at one point or another, accused of fraud. And the photos from this time period are amusing. These tricks did not impress professional conjurers such as Harry Houdini, however. Though the magician, famous for his daring escapes from being buried alive or thrown underwater wearing a straitjacket, was initially interested in the spirituality of his time, he was disappointed to see medium after medium using cheap magic tricks in the dark. Scoffing at their inability to tantalize audiences in plain light, he said, 
it is not necessary for the medium to be even a clever conjurer. Houdini became so outraged at the spiritualism industry that he lobbied his local Washington, D.C. government to outlaw the seance itself. He believed that it was a vile business that profited from tricking grieving widows into parting with their money in exchange for fraudulent contact with the spirits of their lost husbands and family members. Houdini even testified before Congress in support of legislation that would have criminalized fortune-telling for hire and any person pretending to unite the separated in the District of Columbia. Harry Houdini was just 52 when he died on Halloween of 1926. The cause of death was infection from a ruptured appendix, an injury sustained while being repeatedly punched in the stomach by one Jocelyn Gordon Whitehead. Now, Houdini frequently allowed people to punch him in the stomach, and as he told Jocelyn that night, his stomach could take a lot. At the time, however, Houdini already had a broken ankle and was lying on a couch to receive his pummeling, instead of standing up and bracing himself as usual. If you have a business, you need a website. What's the best way to get a website up and running? Choose a website hosting company that makes it simple, like Pair Networks. Pair has over 20 years experience managing the entire digital ecosystem for thousands of online businesses all around the world. Pair makes it easy for you with do-it-yourself website building tools and features, including simple drag-and-drop page design. And they have guaranteed U.S.-based support technicians ready to help you whenever you need it, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Right now, when you sign up with Pair Networks, you'll receive one free month of web hosting. See for yourself how easy it is to build your website for free. Visit pair.com forward slash free to get your first month of website hosting for free by using the code QUICKSTART. That's pair.com forward slash free promo code QUICKSTART to get started today. After two days of intense pain, the magician visited a doctor who confirmed his appendix had ruptured and advised immediate surgery. Instead, Houdini opted to attend his scheduled show. He passed out on stage and had to be forced back to consciousness, after which he finished his show and then went to the local hospital. Before his death, Harry Houdini promised his wife Bess that, if it were at all possible, he would contact her from the afterlife. Over the next 10 years, Bess hosted annual seances to see if the so-called Handcuff King would come through with an encore performance from the spirit world. But on Halloween 1936, she finally gave up, declaring to the world, Houdini did not come through. I do not believe that Houdini can come back to me or to anyone. Harry Houdini was not the only famous contemporary of the day to get caught up in the spiritualism industry. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, author of the Sherlock Holmes books, was a believer 100%. It's ironic that the creator of one of the fiction world's most logical and deductive sleuths was not himself adept at spotting a fraud. In fact, Conan Doyle was a great friend of Harry Houdini, and the two disagreed fervently on the matter of seances and communication with the world of the dead. Their relationship came to an end when Conan Doyle invited Houdini to a private seance, during which the author's wife, Jean, claimed to have had contact with Houdini's mother. It was an embarrassing spectacle for Houdini, as a written message from his so-called mother, the wife of a Jewish rabbi, apparently began with the sign of a cross. On the 21st of March, 1919, Arthur Conan Doyle attended a seance with several companions one of whom was a Scotland Yard detective, another an apparent mind reader, and another a coroner. The seance took place in a small apartment in Bloomsbury, London. 
I have spent years performing with fake mediums all over the world in order to disprove spiritualism, declared their host. Now, at last, I have come across a genuine medium. This was the masked medium, who entered the room wearing a veil that concealed the lower half of her face. She began with a demonstration of clairvoyance. Each member of the committee had been instructed to bring with them a small personal item or written letter. Before the medium arrived, all the objects were placed into a bag, which was then locked inside a box. The medium held the locked box in her lap, and while the committee watched carefully, she proceeded to not only name the objects within, but to describe them in vivid detail. She divined that one of the objects was a ring belonging to the deceased son of the paranormal investigator, and even read the faded inscription. Next came a materialization of a spirit. The committee members tied the medium to her chair, and the lights in the room were dimmed. The medium appeared to enter into a trance, and a luminous mist materialized behind her. One of the committee members later asserted that the mist formed into the shape of an old woman. The form drifted about the room, appearing to pass directly through the medium, before evaporating into the opposite wall. The audience was extremely impressed. Conan Doyle would attend many more such events, and is known to have believed in the veracity of the so-called Cottingley Fairies, pictured in a photograph with two young girls in 1917. Later confirmed to have been a trick of photography, the photo nevertheless convinced many people, like the esteemed British author, that there was more to the world that could be seen at first glance. Conan Doyle delivered a speech on the subject of spiritualism on May 14, 1930, just two months before his death. He opened his talk by saying, People ask, what do you get from spiritualism? The first thing you get is that it absolutely removes all fear of death. Secondly, it bridges death for those dear ones whom we may lose. We need have no fear that we are calling them back, for all that we do is to make such conditions as experience has taught us will enable them to come if they wish. And the initiative lies always with them. Four years after Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's death, on the 28th of April, 1934, a seance held by Noah Zerdin at the Aeolian Hall, New Bond Street, attracted a capacity audience of 560 people. It was the first large gathering of its kind to be recorded, and Conan Doyle was one of the 44 people heard speaking from the other side. You can listen to the recording in which the alleged spirit of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle sends the message, Take care of my boys and my good wife, Jean. Please support the podcast by sharing episodes, leaving great reviews, checking out the show's sponsors, visiting our Patreon, or buying us a cup of tea. Your support keeps the show going, so thank you, and good night. No. They go. The great divine help each quality. And also, take care of my boy and my dog wife, too. God help our movement forward. Let your watchman be honored and forward. Oh, 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 oh,